Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Jessica Lopez again. We, and we are back for part two of the 25th STEM lecture series, Women Engineers, Providing Healing, Promoting Hope. Um, we have with us today, again, Stephanie Cotier, who is a, an engineering faculty within our St. Phillips College Mathematics Department. Um, and as we discussed in part one, her research won her first place in the I, sorry, AIAA International Student Competition held in the 2020 SciTech Forum. Um, we also have with us again, and apologize for the brief introductions, but we do have the longer introductions in our part one. Um, but with us as well, we have um, Hala Haber, and Hala Haber is an engineering and mathematics um, instructor at St. Phillips College. And she's currently working on her PhD in electrical engineering at the University of San Antonio. Um, also with us today is Dr. Marie uh, Michelle St. Hubert, also known as Dr. Michu St. Hubert. Um, and Dr. Michu is also a professor, an associate professor of engineering in the engineering and mathematics department here at St. Philip's College. Um, she did obtain her PhD in biomedical engineering um, at, oh gosh. It's both institutions, UTSA and health science centers. Yes, it was the double. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for your help. Mm -hmm. um, and so today we're going to concentrate on responding to the questions that we received through the uh, Google form. And so we did receive two big questions. And these two questions were asked of all three panelists. So our first question we're going to open up to the three panelists is what are some of the inventions that you have developed or helped develop, even if you didn't do it all by yourself, right? So um, we'll go ahead and open it up to, um, Let's say, uh, Mr. Bear. Okay, so like, like uh, regarding to this question, um, um, like my my uh, concentrations in in theory part. Okay, more than like an in invention part, if I can consider it. Uh, uh, but let's say um, uh, I help to develop uh, develop algorithms, which is computational computational algorithms uh, for students who let's say, uh, uh, doesn't have any information about what are computational uh, 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 algorithms. It's algorithms to solve uh, a different uh, type of uh, differential equation or advanced math uh, 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 problems uh, that you would be able to solve uh, um, following certain algorithm uh, um, in a state of using, let's say, what is, um, let's say, for example, in uh, differential equation, there is certain type of solving first ODE, second ODE, uh, uh, which is we called analytic solution. Uh, uh, the part that I concerned, which is, let's say, in most of uh, softwares, they used to solve the same type of problems they used computational, computational, I'm sorry, uh, uh, methods, or in other words, they called it numerical methods. So I kind of develop in my master thesis, a new uh, method, uh, which is a numerical to solve optimization of problems. So, uh, and it was like um, unique uh, in my side. Uh, also, I am, um, so this is a part, and if, if nobody know what is about what, what is optimization algorithms, so optim optimization algorithms now it's uh, playing an essential role in AI and machine learning, uh, uh, and and this is what I'm doing now in my PhD. Uh, uh, I'm trying to develop like optimization a new optimization method uh, uh, um, in, in in machine learning, but this time I'm dealing with real systems, uh, and we have a platform already, which is like uh, we have drones, we have autonomous like 
cars, mini cars, we can apply to, uh, uh, these type of algorithms for. So th those kind of projects, it's uh, in a process, but I am, let's say I was invent, if I will call it in, in invented uh, 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 algorithms that is related to optimization, which is ready to apply to, you know, to any application, uh, 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 let's say uh, a, a, a platform uh, like two dove or three doves uh, uh, or drones or cube drones. There is so many, you know, so many application uh, uh, to do uh, to this algorithm. And I actually, I'm a part of a team uh, uh, that we are doing uh, this stuff. Uh, so I do, let's say the theory part, and we have an engineers that we like in, in the team, they do the application part. So I hope that, you know, makes sense because the, let's say the, the like the, uh, the, the domain that I am concentrate with, probably it seems it's pure, <laughs> pure math, uh, uh, but no, it's not uh, because we have in, in the team people, they could take these, these methods or a pure math methods and apply it into a, a, a real uh, application. So, uh, so this is. Um, I hope that like uh, uh, answered the question. Yes, yes, yes I believe. Yeah. It. <laughs> Very good. Thank because you. sometimes it's hard because I know like most of the students they are undergraduate probably they don't get it you know because it's right. pure theory so they don't get it so how is a pure theory you can make you know the drawn work about it yeah so it's kind of you know uh, uh, complicated but uh, but because but this is how it works uh, sure. and I want to make it simple for students to get it. <laughs> sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay, uh, we will go ahead and hear from um, Dr. Michu St. Hubert. Um, I've always been in uh, R&D research and development. So even after I went from SAC, I've been developing products for commercial um, work. So the first thing that I've done was work for Data Race. They made modems for notebooks. And so I would do, we would do all of the prototypes. And I happened to have one of the boards. The first project I did was um, for Apple, but this one, I think I need to take off my background. So let me go do that real quick. <clears throat> so that you can see it. Uh, so this is one of the boards that I created help design and prototype because there's some of my ideas that are in there, particularly right here is a crystal that needed to be, I could, this, you can see how thin it is. Oh. So it goes into a laptop. So it had to have a low profile and I was the one that found the low profiles and also another cylinder type that would fit. And I made these by hand. I made about 10 of these. These are production boards. We made a million of them and they went into the TI notebook. So that's when I started and I did this in 1992, 93. Um, and that's when I was with, uh, with DataRace. When I went on to New Tech and I was their engineering manu um, manufacturing engineer and later became their director of manufacturing. Um, New Tech created a broadcasting studio in a box. The, it was called a video toaster. And so it allowed any mom and pop person to do their own broadcasting. If you are old enough and remember Wayne's World, Wayne's World, <laughs> that's what that, that, that product did. And uh, the uh, president, um, Tim Jennison won an Emmy for, for it. And that Emmy is in the office. And I tell students that, I put my hands on the Emmy, you know, that sort of thing. And so when, how I came up, it was on an Amiga platform and Windows was not, the operating systems wasn't good enough. But by the time uh, I got there in, I think, 98, it's when I started working for New Tech. That's when the Windows got caught up in terms of the speed of the Amiga. And so the product that I worked on and created 
and I designed, I was the PCB designer for that, was the uh, VTNT. So the operating system from Windows then was NT. And so not only did I spec the board, design the board, but they didn't have a technician and I was a technician. So I uh, created, I populated the first one and made sure that it worked. And so it's something that was sold in masses also. It made millions of that. And also I did a, created a, a serial digital interface board for them. I, I was their main layout person for, um, for um, New Tech while I worked there. So there was a lot of stuff that I made that was their production, um, production uh, consumer products. I later went on to work for KCI and KCI has two divisions. They have the bed division. So I started working as a PC designer while I was going to school full time at UTSA for my undergraduate. So I worked on the rototrome bed. The rototrome bed is for, it's a bed that rotates 360 degrees. And so um, if someone needs to be mobilized, they can, be mobilized if they have some spinal injury. And also if they, for bed sore reasons, if, if they cannot move, they can be rotated. The other thing that I worked on on the board side, on the bed side was the barometric bed. That is a power assisted bed. Suppose you have someone that weighs 600 pounds, but a nurse is, weighs 150, they have to move to transport the patient. So it's a bed assisted bed a power assisted bed. So this, the nurse is able to transport or anyone else is able to transport this, the patient without injury to themselves. Then they have another side that's the VAC. And VAC is a wound healing. That's when I went from, that's when I really started going into biomedical work. Um, it's a wound healing device where if you have a wound that's not, um, healing is called remodeling um, in biomedical, like rem remodeling your home. Our body does that too when we have injury. And so if it's not healing or it's compromised, you have this vacuum that applies negative pressure and it allows for the remodeling process or the making of collagen and all those extra uh, extracellular matrix proteins to, um, I would say, uh, be expressed and to help increase your, accelerate your healing. And so I started working on the VAC side. So there's a lot of VACs that I worked in. One in particular, there was a um, turtle that its shell was compromised. We needed to adapt it so it could be used, the VAC could be used in an aqueous solution in water for the uh, turtle. And I forgot to say on the board, on the bedside, there was these conjoined twins that the hospital came to us and said, we need to make a bed that comes together. But as soon as the twins are separated, the two beds can become, can separate. Mm -hmm. So I worked on that project. And then after that, I worked for Lancer and Lancer is the number one um, things for the Coke machines or the valves. They are the number ones for valves. So whenever I go to Sam's or Costco, I'm like, yeah, I work on, I work on boards for that. And so um, I worked on a lot of their boards. I was their PCB designer there too. Um, now, when I went to start doing research on my own uh, in Dr. Uh, Tang's class um, uh, lab, I worked on sudden cardiac death. I did a, little, a lot of cardiovascular. That's where I thought I was going to go is to cardiovascular research. And so before I went there, I did another at Health Science Center with Dr. Lindsay. And Dr. Lindsay looks at extracellular uh, proteins my protein that I looked at was Spark, which is secreted protein, uh, acidic and rich in cysteine. Um, and so I worked with mice, the knockout mice that didn't have that particular 
protein. And um, to look at what happens to these proteins after you have a myocardial infarction, which is a big name for a heart attack. So that's how I started with cardiovascular research. So I, after that, I went to Dr. Tang's lab and we wanted, people were dying of sudden cardiac death. But the thing is, they could go to the hospital today and everything would be fine. But then three weeks later, they would suddenly die. Well, what happens is you have overexpressions of certain proteins, one in particular, um, uh, NGF, which is a growth factor. And so the thing is we were devo developing a point of care system that was fiber optic that would, a patient would go in and have a physical. We would, they would use this fiber optic point of care device that we were developing. And they would see that the proteins were overexpressed mm -hmm. and would tell this, this patient, hey, you, have, you might be in the future be experiencing this cardiac event, thus saving their lives. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the projects that I worked on. And for my thesis, my PhD thesis, um, I came up with a LET, logical enzyme triggered net layer by layer nanocapsules. I was looking at metastatic breast cancer. Breast cancer is the leading death, cause of death of women in the United States. And it accounts for the top, breast cancer alone, a top accounts for the top five, of four others equal to one breast cancer. And so when you have metastatic breast cancer, it's palliative care. And if you are at stage four by five years, you will, 20% will still be alive. So there's a lot of women that die. And every year we have a quarter of a million women that are um, diagnosed with breast cancer. So my idea, the, the treatment that happens is uh, pax, pacotaxel, but it's systemic, it goes everywhere. And so it gives you some sort of serious um, side effects. They use nanoparticles, which are 10 to the minus nine thousandths of an inch, right, in terms of diameter. Um, but uh, it is also, they use um, bovine to administer that, bovine serum. And there's still some um, deficiencies in doing that because it goes all over the body. You have this receptor that's called GP60 that attaches to the albumin and sets the albumin in the extracellular, intracellular space. My idea is that when you have breast cancer, there are two matrix metalloproteinases proteins. You have 26 of them, but there's two of them that are overexpressed for breast cancer, MMP2 and MMP9. And so they are, think of them like Pac-Man. They like to cleave and chew certain things, right? They have a sub specific substrate. So, and it's at the region of interest, it's not systemic. You will only find them either when you're born and you're going to your at, uh, to adulthood. After adulthood, you have to have some sort of injury or disease. So they're at the site that has the breast cancer. So instead of having these nanoparticles that goes throughout the whole body, why not line them with the MMP nines or twos substrate that they like to chew anyway and to cleave it at that point. And then that's when the drug is released. So instead of it being a systemic treatment, it's a region of interest systemic uh, treatment, which is more a smart thing for it to be. And for me to do my idea, I had to have a provisional patent because that is my idea that I brought to the college. So in a sense, I have a little provisional patent for that idea because it's my idea that I came up with. So that's all that I've done. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome to have a patent. That's amazing. Yes. Um, Okay, awesome. Okay, can we now hear from Ms. Cotier? Sure. Um, 
so before I went back to school to get my master's degree, I worked for, for an organization that did maintenance on uh, aircraft. Um, and they had a lot of contracts with the government. So I'm kind of limited on how much I can say. Um, but I worked kind of as a tooling engineer for them, developing uh, tooling and processes for taking apart the engines so that they can be worked on by the, the workers and then put back together and put back in the, the planes and service vehicles, right? Um, and I worked on several different processes and like kind of changing different processes and modifying them and creating or uh, modifying tools that already existed to help the process go faster and be safer for the workers. Um, but there is one tool that I pretty much created from scratch. Um, and that was something to help take apart the engine compressor. So uh, in an engine, I worked on turboprop engines. Um, and in an engine, so you have a compressor that compresses the air, and then it goes into the combustion chamber, and then it goes out through the diffuser, and then it's exhausted through the nozzle, and that makes the aircraft go forward, right? Um, so I was working in the division that worked on the compressors or reworked the compressors to uh, did the maintenance there. And mm -hmm. there's a bolt that kind of goes through the entire thing that ties it all together. And there's a separate bolt that goes through the entire compressor and holds it all together. And it's torqued down pretty tight because, of course, you don't want that compressor to come apart while the engine is in use. Uh, that would be very bad. Um, but in order to do the work and uh, maintenance on a compressor, you have to take that bolt out and take all the pieces apart. Uh, mm. Well, the standard method that this organization used was they had you know, a socket that fit over the top of the bolt, and then they used what was called a cheater bar, um, which is basically a 20-foot pipe or 15-foot pipe that they slipped over the end of the socket wrench, and two people would push it to get extra leverage and be able to break the seal on that tie bolt so that it could come apart and they could actually do the maintenance. Um, and that poses a few issues, um, namely the fact that now you have like a 20 foot circle or 20 foot radius circle where everybody has to clear out so that they don't get hit by this cheater bar. Um, and also there's the issue of it still can injure the actual workers who are trying to take that tie bolt apart because even though they're using that cheater bar to get extra leverage, there's still a lot of force that they have to overcome. And that can be very, uh, that can injure people. And actually, while I was there, I did see several people get injured because of this. Um, so what I did is I ended up creating a tool that got rid of the need for that cheater bar and made it a lot easier on the individuals who were taking that compressor apart. And I used uh, a spare gearbox that we had from another department. It's called a torque multiplier. And it literally does what the name suggests, like whatever force you put into it, it's going to multiply it and uh, turn it into a torque force that spins mm -hmm. so that it takes a lot less force in order to break that seal on the tie bolt and get it apart so that we can work on the compressor. So what I designed was a jig that actually sat on the top of the compressor and uh, kind of cannibalized some parts from some broken pieces and other broken tools so that that torque multiplier could actually uh, attach to the top of the tie bolt. And then only a single person then was needed to get the compressor apart. And it was a lot less force and a lot safer for everyone. Um, I was actually able to take a whole compressor apart by myself, which is like unheard of almost, um, which was really neat. And I got to demonstrate my, my invention for the president of the company who was actually touring our facility at the time. And he asked me to fill out some information or like uh, fill out a patent request on it. I'm not sure if they ever actually went through with it um, or if anything came of it, but that was, that was probably the biggest invention that I created there from scratch. Um, another item that I worked on during my master's degree, uh, not so much an invention that I created, um, but it was taking existing uh, software that uh, somebody else had created and trying to apply it in a new fashion um, or apply it to a new uh, area of research, one that's very little understood. And that's, uh, I think I kind of mentioned it last time, uh, shockwave, inter shockwave boundary layer interactions. Um, so using the software to analyze the shockwave boundary layer interactions, which was had never been done before and see if it was even feasible to do. So those are, those are some of the things that I kind of worked on and helped 
move along, I guess. Awesome. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All of you guys' contributions to inventions and things that are being developed. That's amazing. Um, okay, great. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to our um, second question. This is the last question that we have for you all. Um, and then someone asked, uh, do you ever think about changing your major or your field of study or ex field of expertise? Um, so, I mean, I would also want to know why, if you would, <laughs> or why not, if you would not. <laughs> um, but we'll start with uh, Dr. Mishu. Um, I will, I'm going to be honest. There are times when I was going through the process, because it, it, particularly my PhD, um, it was a shifting of gears for me because with electrical engineering, if I do analysis on a circuit, it's going to be exactly what I calculated. But with biomedical, the first thing I had to do was to work with um, cells. So I worked with, for my thesis, I worked with cancer cells. And um, as an undergraduate, I did research with Dr. Agarwal, who was the Dean of the College of Engineering at the time. And I was using endothelial cells. Well, those endothelial cells were not working right. <laughs> they were dying, we couldn't get them to you know, proliferate. We couldn't, we, we, I, we, that's the time that I was like, I think I made a mistake because uh, I couldn't control them. They had a mind of their own. So at that time, yes, I did think of maybe I should not go towards biomedical engineering. But then again, I came to my senses because it's, it's such important work to be able to see um, to answer medical issues and have a solution that people uh, that are in need of these solutions can use. I worked in a bone lab, so there were um, scaffolds that we were that we designed. Matter of fact, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. O, who was at UTSA and later went to Columbia, just came out with a product, a bone graft product into commercial use. It was just released this week. And just to be a part of that, to know that he's been doing this for so long, as I was in a lab with Dr. O, um, is such an accomplishment. And to know that we can save so many lives that need the products that we come up with or the solutions. And so, yeah, there were times when I was like, what am I doing this for? What am I studying this again? but then you come to your senses. So for me, the answer is yes. But would I change it now? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and hear from uh, Miss Stephanie next. Sure. Um, so there were a few times uh, back when I was going for my bachelor's degree uh, that I kind of considered, I guess not so much changing my field of study but maybe like double majoring um because there were so many different things that I I was interested in and engineering is kind of like a straight and not really narrow path but um it doesn't deviate a whole lot and I really I think I mentioned in the last uh session that like I really like space um and I really would have liked to have been able to take more courses like astronomy courses or planetary science courses get some sort of like secondary major or some sort of minor in that. Um, but as an engineering undergraduate, I was felt pretty stretched thin already at the time. So I really didn't pursue that. I kind of wish maybe that I could take some courses like that just because it's still very interesting to me even today. Um, but as far as like actually changing my major and my field of study completely, um, not, not really, I guess. I guess if I were going to go for some sort of career change um, at any point in the future, I'd probably just simplify things like uh, like I'm, I'm an amateur welder and woodworker. So I don't know, maybe like simplifying and making tables or something at some point in my life. But for right now, 
I like engineering and I think I'll stick with it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, we will hear from Ms. Hava next. Okay, so I'm already in the process <laughs> of changing my major. Uh, uh, as I mentioned from the last meeting, I uh, my bachelor and master was in applied mathematics, but I get interested in the uh, control uh, uh, control problem and and especially optimization, optimal control uh, problem. And uh, and when I like when I dive in in, in in the control theory and how much this um, uh, this field or or, or like it's it's very wide. Nobody can imagine like the control theory, how much it's it's wide it is, and uh, and very interesting for me as a mathematician. Uh, uh, anybody probably will hear control. Oh, it's a lot of math, uh, uh, and and it is. And 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 I am let's say this is my field since I'm mathematician, so I liked it. And but when I decided that my next step, if I want to do a PhD. I want to do more or, or like to dive in in that field. So to dive in, uh, uh, I need to do like more like I need I need the application part. Uh, I'm 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 good with the theory part, but I want to see. Okay, so my theories. I'm I'm developing many algorithms in my life, and I need to see those algorithms live. Uh, so I searched, I did my research and I find out like an electrical uh, uh, engineering program, if I will go and pursue this, uh, um, let's say, uh, 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 to, to pursue my PhD in that field, probably I will have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and that, you know, um, uh, and that would make me, okay, so I want to change my major. Uh, uh, I want to do it in the right way. Yes, and the mathematician, it is the right way, but I want to do more application, just, you know, simulation. Uh, I am, let's say, theory person, I'm academic person, and I want to do more like, um, let's say, to see these theories live. And that's what happened. I start working in UIW in the ABS uh, lab, uh, and uh, and I was like in you know many projects with the undergraduate students. I help them to develop like certain algorithms, and we have many platforms in the in the lab. And we start applying some of these mini projects, and and I start liking it. And when then I moved, you know, uh, like to to take the the steps towards my PhD. So I become, I see my, myself now, I am more proficient in the control theory uh, uh, field. So uh, we, let's say in, in the UIW in the ABS lab, I'm now the, the, the let's say, they call me uh, the, the theory part in the, uh, in the lab. So I'm do the algorithm, help students also with me. I have also uh, master's students and undergraduate students help me with the algorithm. So we designed the algorithm and then like stage two, we will apply those in, you know, in a drones or in autonomous, you know, in uh, automotive uh, cars and, and so many like many interesting, you know, uh, 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 platforms. Uh, and, and, and I'm not regretted. Uh, yes, it's kind of hard for me because I need to, you know, I had physics before, but I need like to memorize myself like with, uh, with those stuff. It took a lot from me to review uh, uh, many uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, terms and engineering concepts and, and, but I don't regret it. Uh, uh, because uh, this is my dream and I follow it. And, uh, and when I, you know, yes, you've been like, I've been in very hard time, uh, uh, but once you see an accomplishment, uh, 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 you will say, yes, it's worth it. Uh, and yes, it's worth it. And I like advise any student who is probably in a process to do certain thing and he's probably avoid or afraid to take the risk to do something in you, I recommend him and advise him to do it. Uh, there is no regret, especially if you have that passion and that's what happened with me and that worked with me. I changed my major 
uh, and I'm very, you know, proud of. Yes, I've been through very hard time, uh, and I faced many hard topics. Uh, uh, but at the end, you know, you know the uh, when you let's say when you see like, for example, you see the simulation and this simulation come alive. Yes, it's worth it. Um, and so my answer for this question, yes, I changed my major and I'm very happy with it. <laughs> awesome. Yes, lots of people do change their majors. <laughs> Just right in the middle of everything too. <laughs> yes. Really and so as long good. as you're, like you said, as long as you're pursuing still your main passion or your main goal, that's really what it's all about. Yes, yeah. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for you for all of you being with us again today and taking the time to, to visit with us and respond to all of these um, student questions. And to the students who are watching this, we really wanna thank you for your participation in viewing the first video, asking some questions. Um, and we really hope that you uh, listen to and appreciate the responses. Um, but that is the end of our part two for the women's um, History Month event, which is our 25th STEM lecture series. But thank you all, and I hope you all have a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here and being a part. <laughs>